running running a company or even you know d making a decision to like freelance instead of like you know working with um you know with a bigger company you know you're effectively in, in business for yourself at that point these are things that are there's so there's so many factors that go into whether you're going to enjoy that or not that i think it's like an entirely personal decision to make and oftentimes i found myself not really like there was no one person that i could talk to no one youtube video that i could watch no one article that i could read that would really prepare me for like how like emotionally intellectually like i would feel doing any one particular thing hello and welcome to the art department podcast episode 51 with Emmanuel Shu in San Francisco and myself, Jan Osho in Singapore. And today we have another guest. And I'll throw it to Emmanuel right away to introduce that guest. Yeah, so we have Kevin Bailey here, uh, somebody that I've known for a long time, I think 20 plus years. Uh, and, and, you know, it's scary how long it's been. But uh, we met. Me old. It means we're old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't start with the old stuff. Uh, but I mean,. It, I've really, I've, his story is one of the stories that I find very inspiring and uh, he's done, he's accomplished a lot, but not only has he accomplished a lot, he's also come from a place of, uh, if you, you know, he will tell you his story, but you wouldn't have believed where he came from and how he actually got the start that he got and, and what it took to sort of get to where he is now. Uh, and I, you know, I, I still remember back in the days where we first met and and uh, racing up the hill, uh, racing down the hill. And you got to, you know, at some point we're going to tell that story. But um, yeah. I just, you know, you know, Kevin, bring us back all the way to <laughs> when you first started CG, basically. Uh, and, and let's go from there. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm a big fan of your podcast uh, and love to see what you guys are turning into. So, um, yeah, it's an honor to be on. Um, yeah, and as far as <coughs> the, how I got into this business, um, you know, I, I was like every other, you know, moving, loving nerd when I was uh, back in high school in Seattle. And I went to a public school called Shorecrest High School um, that they were just kind of a forward thinking school. And so when I first went to see Jurassic Park in the theaters, when it came out, um, my mind was just like completely blown. Right. And I've been a fan of like effects movies my whole life, but there was something about that experience of, of watching Jurassic Park that made me realize it's like the, the thing that I loved about all the movies that I had previously loved was actually this sort of visual effects, special effects component to it. It was sort of like making magic, like making worlds and creatures and things that you actually could never do in real life. Um, and those are the kinds of movies that I gravitated to. And, and that was the common ingredient. Right. And so I immediately went to, uh, my high school had a, a drafting class where there was a teacher that taught uh, AutoCAD. And so my buddy, Ryan, who I'd known since I was seven years old, we, we were both just as excited about <coughs> CG. And so we went to our drafting teacher and said, hey, can you teach us how to make dinosaurs with AutoCAD? And um, our teacher, Mr. Norby, he was like, you idiots, <laughs> you can't make dinosaurs with AutoCAD. <laughs> but Autodesk did give us two copies of 3D Studio 2 for DOS. Here are the manuals and two parallel dongles. And if you guys wanna go teach yourselves, knock, knock yourselves out. Like, you know, I'll hang out here at school until um, until however late you guys want. And we took them up on that, right? We stayed late, we taught ourselves, did personal projects, and then we started doing videos for high school assemblies. And he, this teacher, Rick Norby, he let us take the computers home during spring break and summer vacation. Um, so that we could fully immerse ourselves into this and other teachers at the school started to see our passion for this and started allowing us to sort of like steer our homework assignments to like being excuses to do more CG, right? And one thing led to another and I got a job with like the husband of the principal of the school for a little uh, renovation project, like an architectural visualization thing. And that led to a job with Microsoft. 
<clears throat> and so in our junior year of high school, we were working for Microsoft doing a little sort of sizzle piece for what was <clears throat> then to become DirectX. Um, Wait, you were like 15 at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. 16, 16 years old. Yeah, we oh just God. turned 16. Sorry for the and interruption, just, but yeah. No, it was just like this. That alone was like, holy the crap. We're like working for Microsoft and we're in high school. And, um, and you know, especially because this, this, the, the doors that the school had opened, like, you know, my mom had really previously when I was a kid, like, op like she had tried to facilitate. I mean, she went and borrowed money from a friend to buy me a computer so that I, you know, could sort of use like MS Paint, right, or you know whatever. Um, so it was like a, it was from from there to there. You know, that was sort of rags to riches already uh, in my books. And um, and then there was a um, a foundation called Edutopia that came around, um, and they were doing a documentary about schools and how they were um, doing innovative stuff just across the country. And this documentary was narrated by Robin Williams and it was an Oscar winning documentary director. And so we were totally stoked to have a shot at being featured in this thing. And luckily we got selected as one of, you know, a handful of schools across the nation and the story of Ryan and I and how the school enabled us to work at Microsoft was one of the stories that they picked to tell. And it also turns out that the funding behind this documentary came from none other than George Lucas. Um, Edutopia is his nonprofit. And so when George Lucas and his producer, Rick McCallum, saw us in the editing room, um, I remember I got home one day and there was a voicemail. And my mom said, you got to listen to this. So I pick it up and it's like, Hey, my name's Rick. Um, I'm a producer of this little movie you may have heard of called Star Wars Episode One. Um, we'd love to have you guys down to the Skywalker Ranch and hang out for a weekend. Uh, give me a holler back if you're interested. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, I called him back right away and it took him a while to remember who I was. So for a while, I thought it was like a friend that had played a prank on me. <laughs> God, somebody's just totally fucking with me. <clears throat> but, you know, it turned out that we went to Skywalker Ranch, spent a weekend, um, met George's kids, got the e-ticket tour. We were two of the first like 12 people in the world to see concept art from from Star Wars Episode One with Doug Chang's um, uh, production design team there. We got full tour of ILM. I mean, it was just our minds were completely blown, but we were still like 17 years old at the time. We were just just after our junior year, so they couldn't hire us. Right. Um, but Ryan and I made damn sure that we were going to do every single thing within our power to make it so that they had to hire us after high school. So we made this video um, called Speeder Race 96, which was catchy, <laughs> catchy name. But it was basically like our first live action CG combo thing where it was a, 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 a our, it was going to be our senior project. And we we're going to do these hovercraft four, one for each class, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors racing through the forests uh, behind our school and through the halls of the school. And that that was very much so inspired by the pod race, which nobody knew existed in episode one yet. But we were like, yeah, we're, we'll make it close enough to that that they'll they'll see the commonalities, but not so close as to get sued by them. Um, and yeah, we just busted our butts through our whole senior year of high school, sent them a letter and a videotape every month saying, here's our progress, hire us. Here's our progress, hire us. Oh, here are some setbacks, hire us. And finally, about two months before graduating high school, I remember getting a, a, another voicemail from Rick McCallum saying, stop sending us letters, <laughs> quit sending us videotapes, you fucking job. And, and that, so we moved down literally two days after we graduated high school to, uh, join the pre-visualization team, which is a new thing back then on Star Wars Episode One, um, And that's the gig that I met Emmanuel on as a little 18 year old punk. Yeah, he, he I mean, I, I mean, I, I really want to include or at some point show, you know, what you look like then, because <laughs> it was he looks completely different. Uh, and and, you know, little, but he was, you know, breaker. another thing that we had a lot of passion about uh, me and Kevin especially was was cars uh, and 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 driving fast uh, because you know I had you know I had driven you know I had raced some uh, 
uh, and and I I really liked that, and I, I used to drive fast on the street all the time, and he was the same. And we would go up and down in Lucas Valley to the point where they were sending out emails, right, it's just saying, "Hey, stop that <laughs> shit." You know? I, and I remember one time I raced. Well, I didn't race, but I tailgated George <laughs> in his green BMW. I was like, "Who the hell is this BMW going so slow up?" And I was on. I was riding him hard. And then he, we turn into the ranch, and he just goes straight past the security, and I'm like, mm, uh oh, that's not a good sign, because <laughs> we all have to stop and show our badge, uh, and and I was like, ooh, that. But you've done that plenty of times. Is is like get there, and they've told you off, right? Yeah, and there there was actually one time where, because I, I was I had this Mitsubishi Eclipse GST that was like a big wing, and I stuck a giant muffler on there so it was super loud and slammed it and it was pretty obnoxious and um so i would get called out for going too fast even if i was going the speed limit right because the car just looked and sounded fast and uh i remember one morning <laughs> uh rick mccallum because rick rick is like just such a fantastic personality he uh he comes up and you know aside from george he's like the big dog on the ranch right and he comes up and he says, Kevin, um, need to need to talk to you. So the, the fire department, they um, they finally had a word with me about your driving. They said you're driving too fast again. And you know what I told them? I told them to never tell you to not drive too fast ever again. Like he was just like he totally like just had our back because it turns out Rick likes to drive fast, too. Um, so, yeah, and I never, never got any shit for driving too fast after that. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I, I just remember that one run we, we went down. I mean, I thought I was going to, I was thought I was going to die. And my we brakes were, were on fire. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, <laughs> uh, regardless of that, uh, I, I really, you know, when I met Kevin, I was like, I, I can't believe how young, you know, they were. Uh, and, and, and of course, I, I didn't know. I wasn't ready for the ride that would become the rest of our our career, basically. And, yeah. and, and you know, I didn't into him the most perfect way because I wanted him to tell the story first. But Kevin is a visual effects, you know, he was a visual effects artist, visual effects supervisor, uh, you know, part owner or owner of Atomic Fiction uh, and conductor. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these are all sort of his sort of big milestone achievements. And, and I think, you know, let's let's keep going from the ranch, uh, you know, like you now you're at the ranch. You're you know, you're working with George, you know, how, how it, <clears throat> go from there. How, how do you feel? And all that? Well, you know, you know it, was, it was interesting because, um, you know, when we got to the ranch, like I didn't know if we were going to be making coffee coffee and and you know making copies uh you know photocopies for the team or if we were going to be able to do actual work and not only that but like when we were like i knew 3d 3d studio and then 3d studio max released one for like windows nt or whatever it was at the time um but this previous team i knew that they were going to be using electric image form z after effects and photoshop that was like their tool set and i didn't know any of that stuff aside from Photoshop. Um, and so as I was, you know, as we were kind of in the two months leading up to like, when we knew we had the job and then we were like, oh crap, we, we don't want to be just making coffee. <clears throat> we were now just immersing ourselves and training ourselves in those, um, in those applications. And there was actually, there's a couple of guys in Seattle um, where we grew up that, that did know the software and went out of the way to um, to teach us, um, Mike Norb and they those guys that you know they <clears throat> they were a huge help in giving us a springboard as well. So we basically showed up kind of sort of prepared, but not really. And man, we were just thrown into the fire. I mean, like <clears throat> you know, we we would work because we were so young. We would work harder, stay later, like you know, just than anyone had asked us because um, we were just loving it. Like we were just so in love with what we were getting to do. And that was, you know, again, pre-visualization and, and, you know, we tended to call it animatics um, more than anything back in that day. <clears throat> um, they're basically like making a 
low quality, kind of like a video game quality version of what the final shot is going to look like, right? And so what that afforded us the ability to do is to work with the editors directly, Martin Smith and Ben Burt, who's also a multiple Academy Award winning um, sound designer. Um, and then George directly, we would work with George, you know, once or twice a week. And we would just hear their ideas and they would cut together these like little sort of rip of World War II footage of dogfights, you know, and stuff like that. Say, all right, we want something kind of like this, but Star Wars. Right. And we would just go back to our desks and the team would kind of brainstorm it was a very small team, as you know, and then we would just like make it happen. We would just like, you know, and then just send stuff to editorial and they would cut it together and we would we would sort of iterate on it there. And so really and it didn't quite land with me at the time. It didn't quite land with me until years and years and years later after I had started my visual effects company, Atomic Fiction, is that. What we were doing there was actually we were being filmmakers, right? We were getting to actively partake in the making of the movie with George. We were getting to be choreographers, getting to be we were getting to be cinematographers, um, and all in a very rough way. And I remember at like the very end of that experience, like both, each Ryan and I, we kind of worked out that we prevised about 800 shots, um, about 400 of which each ended up in the movie. So between the two of us, 800 shots of this 2000 shot movie, we had had some hand in designing. So it's like a huge influence for, you know, these, these <laughs> two kids. Um, but I remember at the end of that, I, I was so smitten with the final pixel on the screen, like what all this stuff that ILM was doing, because they would take our animatics and then they would make them beautiful and, you know, just totally real looking. And um, we got to do some like final like lightsaber shots in episode one. Um, a lot of the C-3PO stuff where he's got like a puppeteer behind him. We had to like paint him out. And it's like rotoscoping like literally thousands of pieces of wire from this. Because C-3PO in that film doesn't have a, a sort of a skin on him. He's just exposed wires. So we're just rotoscoping just thousands of pieces of like moving wire. All super tedious. But we were so jazzed on the fact that we were getting to touch the final pixel that was on the screen. And only years later did I realize that, you know, pursuit of like having more and more influence on the final pixel, it was all still influenced by the animatics, pre-visualization, and a lot of the stuff that's now coming to the forefront in like real-time virtual production, right? That stuff is all, that's, making the movie the rest is kind of executing it um and now i kind of just i love both but it was a really interesting experience to kind of like get to start at the very foundational filmmaker side and then like exercise the love for making those final pixels and and i've learned a lot of lessons along the way since then yeah i mean i i think it's 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 kind of downplayed it's almost like the concept phase um of you know, like the CG side, because you're really, I mean, I, I was thrown into the animatics, but, uh, and, and Kevin uh, was a big help technically too, to me, because I, you know, I was not, I remember at that time, I, I think I brought in something like, oh, here's Maya version one. Yeah. Um, and, and we were like blown away, uh, you know, at the physics. I think you did the dice, uh, some yeah. dice shot. Yeah, a lot of dice when you rolled those right. dice. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, uh, you know, I remember one time when, you know, and this is kind of how the situation is. And, and this is what Kevin had to deal with all the time because I was only there for a short time. But, you know, I, I remember one time I was doing a shot and, you know, I look behind me and it's like George and George is like, um, yeah, why don't you just move that there? And I swear I was just like, I can't move. I can't do anything because I, you know, and this is something that they deal with every day. Uh, and, and you're right because you do have a lot of influence because that camera pan, uh, and that camera movement is what's on the film. It's just, yeah. you know, it's more polished when it gets to ILM, but it's pretty much your animatic. Uh, mm -hmm. now I did have a question, like there's a lot of camera, you know, operation, you know, camera information, understanding of cin cinema and what kind of camera and lenses like I can't imagine you knew that at high school. How did you 
kind of like, you know, did you consciously learn? You had to learn it at some point because George is like, oh, yeah. you know, put a longer <laughs> lens. You know, you, you know, how did how did that all happen? Yeah, that was, um, you know, <laughs> I well, I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know screen direction. I didn't know, you know, uh, you know, it's like, oh, what is what is jumping the line mean? Like, you know, and and, you know, when do you want to use a long lens and be close far versus a wide lens and be close? Like, you know, all that kind of stuff is just like <clears throat> was years later that I really totally grokked that. So what I had to do really, and this was sort of just trial by fire, is do kind of what felt right. And luckily, these like ripomatics that editorial had made sort of had a sense of screen direction in them to begin with. So they were like a guide that it was harder for me to do the stupid thing than it was to do the right mm. thing. But um, there were plenty of times that like Ben Burt would sit me down and go like, OK, here's what we need. And here's why. Or Martin Smith would be like, you idiot. Like, this is, you know, in the friendliest of ways. But he's just like, this is shit. And here's how to make it great. Mm. Um, and that kind of like creative feedback loop um, was insanely valuable in the same way that like my high school teacher lending me the computer to do the work was insanely valuable. It's just like, you know, here's here here's a here's an opening right here's a door i'm opening for you and I, it would have been just as easy for me not to take advantage of that computer that was being lent to me or not to take the feedback that these editors were giving to heart um but i and i have my parents to thank for a lot of this is just like i my programming at that point really was just like suck it all in right it's like i know nothing and that's okay like i, I was just hungry and passionate <clears throat> and i think that really helped me to kind of use that experience as like it's like film school um kind of just trial by fire right um and nobody you know and i was really fortunate that those guys like didn't judge me for the mistakes i made but they saw it as an opportunity to help me get better um, and so like now is like when I find myself in a position where I can sort of mentor people and do that, um, it's so satisfying to pay it forward because I didn't know how valuable it was at the time, but I sure do now. Um, and yeah, so, you know, big thanks to them for that. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because I, had I had, um, at one point my, like my father was a university professor, um, and so when I decided to do this Star Wars thing, like I'd gotten into Stanford and, you know, a bunch of other schools and I decided to do Star Wars instead for obvious reasons. And you, but wait, I, you got into Stanford. Yeah. Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> what kind of grades did you get? I there they were OK grades, but like, you know, um, they weren't great. But, you know, it was like a non weighted. It was like a three point seven or something. And I had a 14 Jesus. something SAT or whatever. So they were good, but they weren't like oh my God, this guy is like, you know, the academic king by any means. And and part of the reason was is because I spent so much of my time screwing around with doing visual effects stuff in high school that I didn't, you know, I didn't always, like if you look at my report cards, they, you know, there's like, could achieve more. Like, you know, that was like the common theme. I, I keep <laughs> so, I why do I always have this image that you are a high school screw up and that all <laughs> you did well was CG? That I, for like the last, time all these years that i've known you that's what i kept thinking you were but that that yeah. makes sense now that that you were actually that's why you went after it with a passion yeah well you know it's it's funny like and i do have a few look, teachers to thank for like not being a total screw up but there there were definitely look i mean that i didn't get into stanford based on my grades right um but, but i'll tell you another story here in one second that, you know but i think it was more like you know the, the the passion you know the essays and all that stuff and i sent them a copy of this video that ended up being the thing that got us hired to lucasfilm so you know it was like a lot of the stuff that <clears throat> got me the the job at lucasfilm was also the stuff that got me into the school um because it's not just numbers um but i said okay i'm gonna defer that until i'm done with star wars and then come the end of Star Wars, I'd learned so much from all these other, you know, from George and from Ben and Martin and all these other people that were around me that I said, you know, what? I want to go to film school. 
Like, I want to go to USC film school. That's where all these guys went. Like, you know, I, I want to do that so that I don't have to be the rookie in the room that doesn't know any, you know, doesn't know any of this stuff. And um, so I applied to USC and I got, you know, letter of recommendation from Ben Burt, um, who's a four-time Academy Award winner and, um, you know, sent in on my reel and my, you know, I'd worked on Star Wars and I wanted to go to the film school and, and I got a letter that's like, hey, yeah, you've, you got into USC, but you didn't cut, make the cut for the film school. And that was like a, that was a, at the time it felt like a big gut punch. Um, because I thought that everything that I'd done up until that point had earned me a spot, uh, at USC film school. And, um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, it, it didn't pan out that way. So, and in retrospect for, for me, that was like the best thing that could have happened. Right where it's like, all right, screw it. Like, I'm just going to keep, keep my head down and I'm going to keep taking advantage of these opportunities that I've already learned so much from. Um, and that's when <coughs> our friends, uh, Jonathan Rothbart, Stu Mashowitz and Scott Stewart, um, from ILM had, they approached Ryan and I and said, Hey, you know, we know you got Star Wars episode two coming up, but like, we're doing this thing, this company we're calling the orphanage. Do you guys want to join it as our first two employees. Um, and he said, well, I, well, I'm not going to USC. So yeah, sure. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. But that, that ended up being huge, man. I mean, the orphanage was huge for actually, I think a lot of people, it was a springboard, <clears throat> you know, to, I mean that, so the orphanage is the second place that we, you know, we, I worked with Kevin. Uh, I mean, I, I went there much later. Well, not much, but I mean, definitely <laughs> later. Because I still remember you showing me the office at the Presidio, going, "Hey!" And it was that was it was just like a room then. Yeah, it, it was, was just one a room. room. It was like you, Stu, uh, Ryan, and Jay Bart, and I think that yeah. was about it. And then it, maybe a couple producers, but you know, we went there after dinner one night, and you go, "Hey, let me just show you, you know, where I'm working," and yeah. you know, and little did I know. Yeah. I would end up there maybe like a year later or some thing. But, but you know, that was like, you know, I think a lot of people probably don't know what the orphanage is. Uh, you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> the orphanage, how do you explain the orphanage? Um, you know, it's just like, so these guys that started the orphanage, they were sort of born out of, you know, the, the majority of them worked in a department at ILM called the Rebel Mac Department. And Rebel Mac was uh, a department, they used actually all the same tools that we were using on the previous side, right? Form Z, Electric Image, uh, After Effects. Um, the reason why, so that's why they were called, that's where the Mac part of their name came from. And the reason where, why they were called Rebel Mac is because they basically decided to work completely outside of ILM's pipeline. They were like, we don't want any of your tools, we don't want any of your, like, you know, any of the baggage, right? And they would take these scenes that were sort of like, small scenes that you needed to be nimble and iterate quickly and come up with, you know, not spend six months to R and D, you know, some super computer science -y thing to make a scene look good. It just was just like, make it just look good artistically. <clears throat> and so the rebel Mac team devised devised a way to like do that, um, with an off the shelf tool set. And those guys had so much success in doing that, that they said, well, we want to start our own company using the same methodology. And because we were all using the same tools, um, we said, okay, cool. And the, 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 the goal of that company was to basically like do ILM quality work without having the scale of ILM. And two was to make their own content. Um, and that was like a, the original productions content creation thing was, was, you know, one was the other core tenant <laughs> and, um, and that company grew over the course of, you know, five years, maybe even less to over 200 people. Um, but it always kept that same rebel mentality of like, we're and, and there, it was funny because there were like rebel units that sprouted up inside of 
the orphanage, like the orphanage itself was kind of a rebel unit. And then there were other little rebel units that would sprout up that would use, you know, 3DS Max in Brazil. Like, you know, Shadi Amasazada was like a huge champion of that. And, you know, others, you know, wanted to go a more RenderMan based route. I was one of the to, you know, keep doing things, you know, uh, like Matt Hendershot was like giant, like Maya fluids, like just wanted to conquer the world and do any fluid dynamic stuff um, you, <clears throat> by manipulating Maya fluids. So there are all these teams that just exercise their passion, but everybody, because, because there wasn't like a big stringent pipeline, everybody had to bring their A game personally as an individual contributor in order for anything to ever work. And if you couldn't bring your A game as an individual contributor, you you probably weren't going to last there. Not because they would fire you or anything, but just because you would hate it and leave. So the people that were there, you know, were insanely good. Um, but they weren't like old guard insanely good. They were like young energy and not just young people. I mean, it was a pretty young crowd, but like young energy and just really wanted to come in and do things differently and some of them were jaded by institutions at bigger companies and and so it was a really fun place um but it was also extremely hard work right where mm -hmm. because there was no real infrastructure you were only as productive as like how, a how smart you were but really also how many hours you put in and i remember on hellboy um, it was my first show as a CG supervisor, and I was also a sequence supervisor. And I worked 137 hour work week, um, finished to finish my scene, and then leaving the studio, the producer of the show, uh, the executive producer of the, the, the facility, chased me out and said, Kevin, I know you've been busting your ass, but we have this other shot that's like in real trouble, and like Guillermo del Toro is pissed. Um, you got to come. Is that the infamous, the infamous shot? Yeah. yeah. Um, still remember the shot name, right? I mean, it's just like, it's that, that infamous. And, um, and, you know, first I said no, and then I got in my car and I thought, oh, geez, they need me. And that, that was sort of the, that sort of family, like I loved everyone there. Um, and so went back and worked 128 hour a week or <clears throat> 22 or something. I forget what it was, but it was just it's stupid, right? Um, but, but we kind of loved it, you know, at the time, um, I wouldn't do that anymore and I wouldn't suggest no. anybody that, but it was like in that time, in that environment, in this industry where it's like at that time we were still doing things that had never been seen before, um, <clears throat> that it was just, it was, yeah, it was kind of magical, um, and miserable and magical, <laughs> magical. I mean, I, I always refer to the orphanage days as sort of. Uh, one of the best times that I've had working at a company, uh, one of the best and one of the worst, uh, yeah. you know, best it, because it, it was really, really like family. I mean, it, it felt like summer camp, you know, nothing's yeah. really quite organized and, you know, you're surprised that everything is actually working. But, um, but, you know, in the end, you, we, each person was responsible for so much, but, then when we went to see the film, it, it made it into the screen. Whatever you were passionate about, you see it on the screen. And, yeah. you know, it's just one of those. I mean, I still show work from then, you know, like the, because I'm that's I mean, I thought it was, you know, I was really blown away, uh, uh, you know, but it, it was just one of those places where, yeah, that was really great. And, you know, I, I would say that I remember it fondly. But then mm -hmm. there were also the, the super long nights, the disorganization, you know, the the things that 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 plague a place like that, right? Yeah. Um, because that's just how it how it goes. So, so then you you know, so you're at the orphanage, you know, we you know we went through multiple films, you know, ups and downs. What 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 happened then? Well, <clears throat> I <clears throat> so I actually I decided to leave after i think it was year seven and i didn't really want to but i saw like you know we were still growing and and um you know again i didn't have any business history or no formal technology education or any of this stuff but it was just like you know in the early days it was like somebody had to set up a render farm so it was me 
it was somebody had to set up a server. It was okay, I'll do that, you know. And and so <laughs> a lot of this stuff came out of like necessity of just like again, it all came back to the passion of like making the the pixels and just like I, I bullheadedly never let anything get in my way <laughs> to for for doing that and often to my own detriment. But like that was that was like you know, and, and actually, Jay Bart, um, Jonathan Rothbart, um, who uh, was <coughs> the the one of the co-founders of of the orphanage, he would often sit me down and he'd be like, "Hey, you want to be a visual effects supervisor one day?" And be like, "Yeah, you know, I would. I I think so. I mean, you know, I like that." And um, and he said, "Well, then you just got to stop being so technical. You got to not be in the weeds." Um, and um, and actually, I'm glad I didn't listen to him um for the most part and i know what he means now but like like then it was actually it's it's ended up being kind of like a superpower and and i'll get to that in a second that you know i did have that tech like the sort of technology by osmosis sort of background um because towards the end of the orphanage we were growing so much but not we weren't growing the technology infrastructure proportionally mostly because we couldn't afford to and I just kind of saw the writing on the wall where I was like, we can't keep going at this pace and on the backs of people who now we're bringing in, you know, you get over 200 people and all of a sudden it's like, you can't really be a family anymore. And then if you're not a family anymore, really, you can't ask the same self-sacrifice of people, but we were still. And it just started to not feel <clears throat> as right for me at the time. And so I said, okay, here's a list of 10 things uh, to do in order to, um, in order to s grow. Well, I'm going to start on Harry Potter. Uh, no, no, it was Pirates of the Caribbean. It was my second or third show there, visual effects supervising. And I said, you know, here are the things that need to happen, or I'm going to, this is going to be my last show here. And, you know, they, for a lot of really good reasons, just couldn't make any of those things happen. I think there was like half of one of the 10 or something that did. Um, and I said, okay, cool. Like totally get that. Um, but I'm going to go over here and do this other thing. And I went to basically the polar opposite, um, uh, because Doug Chang, who ran the star Wars art department at, uh, Lucasfilm when I was on star Wars episode one worked with as well. Um, he was, starting this joint venture he'd been running a, a, a concept art company called ice Blank. um it was just doing all this brilliant design work for spielberg and robert zemeckis and and they'd done design on polar express and um uh beowulf um and i think monster house as well and and so zemeckis and doug chang they were just like you know jived so well that uh, when Disney approached Zemeckis to build a studio to do motion capture films, uh, you know, Bob said, hey, Doug, like, why don't you and I do this together? And so Doug picked up the phone and called me and called Ryan and said, hey, why don't you guys come over um, and help me start this thing up? Um, it's going to be massive. It's going to be 700 people and it's Disney funded. And you know, it was all the things that the orphanage wasn't, right? We were going to have infrastructure. We were going to have resources to get all the hardware we wanted and have an actual R&D team. And and so that was that was all super attractive to me because um, it solved all the problems that I saw at the time. And I ended up going, Ryan didn't. He stayed at the orphanage. Um, but about a year and a half after that, the orphanage went out of business. Um, yeah. And still to this day, a lot of the most talented people I know in the industry are people that like you, that I worked with at the orphanage. Like they've just, you know, like in, you know, Singapore has Alex Pritchard there and, you know, ILM and, you know, there's, there's just at all corners of the earth. There are orphans that have, um, spread out that are just insanely talented. Um, and oh, when yeah. I do run into somebody who knows about the orphanage, they're like, Oh yeah. Like, I know so many talented people that came from that place. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, incidentally, we, uh, you know, that's the next place we worked at together mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, at Image Movers. But you're right. I mean, there are a lot of <coughs> orphans out there. Um, 
you know that that some of them are really making some big waves. I mean, I, I worked on Covenant with uh, Christian. Uh, he was from the orphanage, and you know, I know Dagan's doing really well. Uh, yeah. Dagan Potter. Uh, you know, like there's a, just a ton of people working that all got a lot of their start from the orphanage, and and I'm definitely really grateful for that. And so now you're at Image Movers. Uh, definitely completely opposite. Uh, you know, how, how was that compared? <clears throat> well, you know, it, it, it was kind of what I thought it was going to be in a way, right? Where it's like, <clears throat> you know, um, we had all these resources and could hire anyone, but there was an interesting phenomenon that I witnessed there, um, which is that when you, when you have 10 of the best of the best in the world at, uh, the same table how do you pick whose idea is best right and we had a very flat org structure there because everybody was so qualified and it was really interesting to see how hard it was to get decisions to be made now the decisions that were made were brilliant and i think if that company had been allowed to continue going we got to do two films and then disney um, decided to shut us down but i think we would have been a well-oiled machine with a lot of great great stuff. But that said, you know, we did at at that scale because we had so many great people and such a flat org structure and so much technology, we did burn a lot of money, right? Where it's like the render farm was ever fully utilized, like, you know, 100% utilized for 24 hours straight, like twice over the course of a show, right? There would be like two days where we would use all the infrastructure that we needed and the rest of the show, you know, probably averaged out to like 20% utilized, right? So we have all this like capital investment sitting there <clears throat> and not really being able to, you know, contribute um, and kind of acting as a boat anchor. Um, so, you know, it was like, it, but that was also my first experience um, you know, being the visual effects supervisor on a giant film, um, which was a movie called Mars Needs Moms. That was the last, the last film is like a, 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 a kid's film. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the heck out of working on that, that film. So I had got a lot of great experiences there. There were a lot of excellent work there. I met a ton of like other amazing people. And, and most importantly, um, I, managed to craft a really good relationship with Robert Zemeckis while I was working there. Um, and that relationship has continued on. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, fast forward to the day, I'm like, you know, visual effects supervisor on, on Disney's Pinocchio that he's directing. And so really from that point on, <clears throat> um, with very few exceptions, um, I've done, uh, almost every project that I've been on has been with, with Bob. Um, so that was just, hugely hugely valuable oh and and is is that did you feel a need like obviously disney got shut down so it wasn't you know like you had much we all none of us had much of a choice did you you know how did you just kind of decide hey you know i'm gonna i'm gonna open up atomic fiction here you know like that's a that's a very daunting task isn't it i mean yeah, it was like a very, very daunting task. Um, and I think that the, you know, well, <clears throat> so <laughs> what it really amounts to is that, like, Luke, you know, Lucasfilm was its own thing. That was just my intro to the industry. The Orphanage was like this sort of like smaller, you know, really nimble like you know we we weren't weighed down by a bunch of infrastructure but also suffered because of lack of resources whereas imd it was almost the flip-flop right we had so many resources and we we're kind of weighed down <clears throat> by sort of the technological and business burden of it and so when disney decided to shut imd down <clears throat> we sort of like had a bit of runway in terms of time to think about what we we're going to do <clears throat> um and at that point, Ryan, my friend who I'd known since I was seven, had also joined IMD after the orphanage went under. <clears throat> and we just said, you know what? Like, we, we've we had enough of learning from other people's mistakes. Like, we want to make some of our own. And let's start a visual effects company at the time where, like, all the visual effects companies were going under, right? Like, r &H had gone under. 
the orphanage had gone under cafe FX had gone under like the list goes on and on and on. <clears throat> and, um, and you know, we, and I think asylum went under at the time they, they, they were just like, they were dropping like flies. And <clears throat> we said, well, well, you know, clearly there's a lot of work out there. So why can't anybody actually make business sense out of this? And, um, and this sort of like this, imbalance that we'd seen the yin and the yang that we'd seen kind of like in a weird dysfunctional way with like what the orphanage had and what IMD had or the lack of yin and yang <coughs> I guess at, at those places was kind of made a light bulb go off and said well geez cloud computing is sort of a thing these days I mean this was back in 2010 um, maybe we could make use of compute on demand to scale up to a render farm that's as exactly as big as we need to when we're delivering a show and then not have to pay for it at all in between projects. Wouldn't it be great if like our technology uh, expenditure ramped up and down with our need? Um, and so we said, all right, well, maybe if we take that and that handful of kind of other ideas that all had to do with like culture and, and brand, um, like let's start a company and so we did we started atomic fiction um in my like living or it was in my home office um <clears throat> with no funding um eventually we got like one friend of the uh, family to put in like 50 grand to help <clears throat> you know buy our first espresso machine and a couple of laptops um but yeah from that point on it was just you know we were constantly like iterating on these ideas of how do we how do we stay nimble, but also support our crews in a way that's going to help us do like tippy top A list work? Um, and cloud had a lot to do with that. How we ran productions had a lot to do with that. Um, how we uh, interacted with our teams and and valued them um, and certain other things had a lot to do with that. And those are all just from lessons that came from all the other experiences that we'd had um, just kind of put together in a way that seemed to make sense. I mean, did you did you ever think, you know, I, I got to learn from the orphanage. I can't, you know, sort of go back to, you know, because like, you were creating, in a sense, another orphanage because, you know, it's a small company. Uh, that's how the orphanage started. Uh, was there any, like, things you're like, okay, I got to really make sure, you know, to keep the culture but maybe not work my people to death or, or maybe there's more secure, you know, you know, whatever you thought yeah. was the problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we definitely had a lot of, uh, ideas about that, um, kind of thing. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we really never had an appreciation, even though we've been very close to running the business, cause you know, we were employees number one in orphanage. We were the two. Of the, I was one of the first non-art department people at Image Movers Digital, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, I was I was running, um, you know, running one of the shows there. Uh, so I had been very close to sort of like the operations and the business side, but I'd never been fully responsible for it myself. Um, and I learned a bit about how much sort of leadership. Um, like the owners at the orphanage and the leadership at the, the the sort of executive level at IMD had actually sheltered me from some of the like the uglier bits about, you know, how um, the industry can work, right? What happens when a schedule pushes or what happens when, you know, a client, a large studio client who you're bidding on their next show is a month late and paying you on the work that you just finished, right? Um, like how do you make ends meet there? What happens when somebody comes to you at the 11th hour with a totally unreasonable demand? Um, it's easy. It was easy for me as an artist to sit there and be like, well, you should have said no. Right. But like, that's just not, that's just not how it works. Right. Um, it, you know, when it, when it comes down to it. So, um, and actually I need to plug in my laptop here real quick. So you're going to need to make an edit. <laughs> Or not, you can just put this. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> Why is it, are you running out of battery? <laughs> yeah, for certain, whatever reason, my the <laughs> see, I'm having technology problems. Um, no, the the charging brick that I have right here is not working. This is not. It might be a bad cable. There's never. <clears throat> 
All right. <clears throat> There's never All right, we're an end. Back. Acknowledge. Um, we're back. <laughs> go ahead and finish. You know, I had a question, but uh, and Jan, please, if you had any yeah, questions. Yeah, no, no, um, I'm good. I'm good. Free, but uh, uh, go ahead and finish what you were saying, or were you done? Yeah. No. Um, I think I. I mean, ba basically, it's like. I think running a visual effects company was a lot harder than I had ever imagined it would be, right? I mean, it was just, it was so brutally hard. And that forced us to sort of adapt to the reality of how difficult it is. You know, there's there's a lot of difficulties with cash flow and client management and the, politi the politics of it all. And so a lot of the sort of like <laughs> the, the ideals that we started with of like, ah, oh, yeah, we're going to have a great work-life balance. It's like, some of the, a lot of times we did, but some of the times we absolutely didn't. Um, and um, it was because we were kind of forced to make a decision of, do we want to stay in business and um, grow and value the, these other goals that we have um, and continue to employ these people who are on our team who we love? Or do we say, no, we're, we're just going to, we're just going to fail um, or we're going to tell the client no in a scenario where they need us to say yes. They desperately need us to say yes. And um, and then everybody's out of a job. Right. Like there were times where it's like the, the decision was that black and white. And it's like you just can't <clears throat> you can't. Like I was never able I wouldn't have been able to grok the gravity of those decisions until I was in the driver's seat and responsible for them. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so, but you know, that said, there were times where it's like having our, like, this is what we want the company to be. This is what we want to stand for. These are the things we are going to try to achieve. Even if we never quite got there, there were always things that we like, we could strive for, right? Like, and they were, they would kind of like help our compass, like, stay pointed north and sometimes we would kind of be heading like northwest for a little bit but you know we could always get back to north because we knew really what we wanted to be um <clears throat> and i think like actually a lot of i won't say a lot of companies but like i know some pretty big companies who don't have that right and and that's what i think people really refer to when they say that a company has soul it's not it's not that they have the best soft drinks or the best coffee machines or the coolest events. It's when they have sort of a vision that everybody can kind of rally around and kind of check themselves against. Um, and we had that at Atomic Fiction. I think it was really special. Yeah, I mean, I, I also did some freelance stuff for Atomic Fiction um, and, and you know, the, the one thing is, you know, because you, you talk a lot about infrastructure, you talk a lot about you know, th those kind of things because, you know, you were interested in it. But I, I also want to ask you this question, and I, I don't think I've ever been able to ask you this question, is that, um, you know, when I've known you, you, you know, you blossomed into a really good artist. I mean, that's just something that, you know, throughout even this interview that you haven't really touched upon. And, and I and, and but I, I will say that, um, you know, do you miss that? <laughs> I mean, because you've turned into, you know, like businessman, uh, visual effects supervisor. And of course, that takes a certain eye to be able to do that. Uh, you know, you, you know, almost, you know, directing. Uh, that's another thing that that's coming up possibly. But the thing is, uh, you miss making art. I mean, you're a great artist. Yeah, I do. I do. And I really love those days where, um, and thanks for reminding me of those days because some, sometimes they seem really far away, but <clears throat> yeah, those days of sitting down on the box and, you know, look at things or, uh, lighting a scene. Or I remember like, this is just the horror movie Jeepers Creepers two that, you know, I had mm. to like, you know, look Dev and, and really, um, uh, you know, uh, make some, it was our first creature project. We had no idea how to do creature stuff and just figuring it out. And, and I, you know, just remember like finally like achieving this, like 
beautiful subsurface translucency look in the wings with god rays going into the dust under it as it was flying and it's just like the the feeling of like i just made something that looks totally fucking real um <clears throat> is like with my own hands right um it is there's nothing quite like it and i think in a way it's like one of the reasons why i am so excited about like the virtual production of it all these days because what that is doing through you know tools like what the the epic team is doing with unreal um what they're doing is they're making that tool set um and the ability to to um have that same level of creative creative satisfaction available to like the filmmaking team right so for for years and years, like as I was like VFX supervising or running a business or whatever, all I could do is like sit in a couch with a laser pointer and go like darker, brighter, sharper, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, oftentimes I would like jump in and do a shot for fun just to make sure that, that I like, like didn't lose my nuke mojo or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> um, but a lot of times it was just like Photoshop paint overs. If I couldn't articulate with my voice or if I felt like I was like not being clear or not being understood, I would go in into Photoshop and, and do some stuff. But that was sort of the extent of things. But like with with UE now and, um, you know, I can go in and I can I can pick up a virtual camera in a scene that looks beautiful and, you know, and adjust some lighting and oh, let's let's get some depth of field going here. And, you know, hey, now I'm composing a frame that looks like a movie um, quickly. And, you know, of course, there's still a big team behind it, but there there was back then when I was an artist as well, there was always the other departments in the in the workflow. So so it feels, you know, it, it's not only a great tool set for like creation and expression of ideas, but it's also um, the first time in in over a decade, probably 15 years that I've had that feeling of like actually personally creating again which is um it's pretty awesome yeah and 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 you know <laughs> I, I i i don't know uh last time we talked i i really think that you know you, you're possibly coming into another form of uh art filmmaking whatever you want to call it you know uh and who knows what's going to happen with that uh, you know what, what's in the horizon for you what 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 is it that you think you want um, or excited I, by? Yeah, I, um, you know, it, it's funny. Like, I'm still excited about, like, just making movies and making cool pictures. It's the same stuff that I was excited about when I saw Jurassic Park. Um, and that's how I know that I'm, like, I'm doing the right thing, right? I know that I'm, like, I'm in the right profession. There's, I know lots of people who, you know, they get burned out on visual effects and they're like, I want to go work for, you know, Google or Amazon or whatever. And that's great for them. Like, I know that I'm in the right profession for me, like just because it's the same thing that drives me today as it did way back then. And in looking through the, the sort of the story <coughs> that we've talked about, like all the steps along the way, like there's zero chance that I could have put, I could have laid out those steps and said, here's my plan. I'm going to do that. There's zero chance that I could have done that. It's all just like, you know, doors opening and me squeezing a foot into it or falling into it on accident sometimes, you know, and it's, and sometimes, but, and sometimes it's like taking two bad experiences and putting them together to make something that is really good. But you know, if I spend my entire time trying to avoid bad experiences, I would have never been able to come up with a thing that's good, right? And, you know, we sold Atomic Fiction, right? We sold the 300 person visual effects company and had a happy ending to a visual effects company story. Like that, that rarely happens these days, right? And there is no predicting <coughs> how, how we got to that point, right? So I'm, you know, I, I'm reticent to predict the thing that's going to be happening in the future. But like, I just, you know, Robert Zemeckis, who is, I mean, he's one of the reasons why I'm in this industry to begin with. I mean, Back to the Future and, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit are two of my, the, the movies that influenced me most, um, uh, you know, growing up. 
um, you know, now I'm working with him and he asked me to second unit direct on Pinocchio that we're doing right now. So I, I did, you know, uh, several weeks worth of, of directing a second unit, um, where he was entrusting me to like make things look like to his expectations. And, and that, that was, uh, both really intimidating and also, um, you know, incredibly inspiring and I had a lot of fun doing it and he didn't, he hasn't made me go back to reshoot any of it yet. So, um, so I'm taking that as a, as a plus. Um, but like that, that sort of more hands-on, you know, film, I mean, everybody wants to be a director, right? And there was a, there was actually a time period where I was like, I do not want to be a director because you see what they go through, um, in, <laughs> in other ways. But now after having run a company, I think I've been hardened to most of those things, um, and uh, and I think it could that could be a lot of fun, especially with the sort of new generation of filmmaking tools and techniques and virtual production coming along. I think it opens up a lot of really really exciting opportunities for telling telling. You're not going to show anybody anything that hasn't been seen before because we've kind of done most things in visual effects now. Um, there was a time where that wasn't the case, but now it's sort of it it is, but I think now it's it's really going to be telling the story that hasn't been heard before. Like that's that's really where um, where the focus is. That that's where the value add is going to be. And these tools, I think, are going to help us do that in a really remarkable, efficient way. Um, so that that makes me excited. Yeah, that, that's awesome, man. Uh, Jan, did you have any? Uh... Uh, I mean, I think that's that's kind of our standard question that that. Um, we should definitely ask because I mean, so far it sounded kind of like kind of one success after the other. And, and of course there's always like little, like uh, little ups and downs in there. But I mean, um, were there ever, was there ever a time um, where like, I don't know, you were, you were just so ready to throw in the towel and say like, this is it. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe there wasn't, or maybe there was another difficulty. I mean, we had, guests i think on this show that were battling addiction we had uh, or like severe illness loss in the family loss of friends and all these kind of things but i mean was there was there a time where you thought like this is it for for me yeah and then, and then you came out on on mm. top after you know obviously yeah well <laughs> i th yeah there there are probably uh, too many to talk about here, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. Um, one was during that second week at the orphanage where I was working, we were working on a Hellboy on that shot LF 19 and I hadn't had any sleep and I was, my girlfriend, um, at the time was, um, who then later became my wife, who then later became my, my ex-wife, um, <laughs> is, um, you know, we were driving in, it was like one of the few days where I went home to go take a shower and I was driving in and I was just so goddamn tired. And we we're driving down Lombard street, which is a pretty big street in San Francisco. And I just totally blanked on a red light and I just like, just blasted right through it. And the front of my bumper must've kissed the, the end of the, the car that was coming through the intersection. Um, and I just remember pulling over and I just started bawling. Right. Because I just I, I realized that it's like this this mental state that I was in. I wasn't addicted to any substances, but I was addicted to like the amount of, you know, that I was putting into my to my job to the point where I wasn't sleeping um, and that had almost killed us and probably somebody else, too. Um, and that was really heavy for me. And that was sort of the start of me going like, OK, I'm passionate about this. I also need to think about like my health and I need to think about other people. It's not just about me and my passion for this, for this work. <clears throat> and I think had that experience not happened to me, you know, I, uh, I probably would have messed up, um, in a lot of other ways, but that, that was, I think a pretty critical turning point for me to start to like actually have a productive relationship in my life. And, and, you know, um, you know, now, now I have, uh, kids and, and, you know, uh, I, yeah, that was, it was like, it still haunts me, right. That, that experience. Um, and then, you know, the other thing was it, it, the at atomic fiction, um, again, I never had any idea how hard it would be to run a visual effects company. 
and especially because we didn't have any outside funding, um, like by the time that we sold the company, our payroll every two weeks was $1.2 million. And so that's, and you know, basically with like Ryan and I owning the company, right? I mean, we had a few, few other smaller shareholders, but it was our asses on the line and we didn't have any like giant, you know, it's just like, you know, bank accounts that we were sitting on, you know, we had like our 409Ks that we got from IMD and that was kind of it. <laughs> and so we really had put everything on the line. Um, and if, if we missed a payroll, um, we knew that we would lose all credibility. We knew that we would probably lose our houses. Um, you know, it was like, it was really heavy, heavy stuff. And that weighed on me to the point where, you know, it was one of the contributing factors to like my marriage failing. Um, and, uh, I just didn't, I was putting so much work into the company that I couldn't, I couldn't even grok what it meant to put work into my marriage. Um, cause it just seemed every like a responsibility to these, you know, people who I love, my employees was so great that it, my own life always seemed like the lower, lower priority to me. Um, and, um, because if I let them down, you know, I'm letting dozens, hundreds of people down. If I let myself down, it's like, or my wife or whatever, it's just like, oh, it's just a couple people. Right. Um, and it was sort of like, like I hear myself say it now and it's sort of, it's a little sick, but it was also, it made a lot of sense at the time. Like I felt so beholden. Um, so that was actually one of the reasons why we decided to sell Atomic Fiction at the end of the day, or at least one of the reasons why I thought that it would be a good idea to do it is I gained so much satisfaction out of this company and what we built. Um, I had also reached a point where I was just like, it was just too much to bear without either bringing in like substantial outside investors in um, to reduce the financial sort of risk or like I was just going to like go and do my own thing for a while. And so, you know, right now I'm independent visual effects supervisor. I got this opportunity to direct. I, um, you know, I have a small team that I work with on Zemeckis' uh, production side, Sandra Scott, who is also at IMD and, and, uh, and Atomic. She's side by side with me as my, you know, producing partner in that. Um, and a lot of the people on the team are people that I've worked with, uh, before and know and love. And so I think, you know, in a way, like I've kind of back to this small team that <laughs> was, was back at the ranch. Um, I just know a whole heck of a lot more now and in a way like have more of an ability to appreciate it because of all the things that I've gone through. Wow. Well, good on you. And thanks for sharing that because, you know, I think a lot of people, can understand that. I mean, but you know, in a sense it was, it's almost like a, a workaholic, uh, kind of, yeah. uh, attitude. And, and, and I know I went through it and a, a lot of us freelancers go through that, although we don't have the, the responsibility of a company. I mean, I can't imagine that. And I would never want to open a company that, I mean, cause you, you know, you got to worry about people's livelihoods, you know, yeah. and they don't realize that that constant stress hurts everything around you, including your own health, mental health, physical health, everything. But like, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, I've known you for so many years, but I think the last couple of times we talked, uh, you know, since you've been in, independent, I think, I mean, I don't think I've seen you better to be honest, uh, you know, in, in a more, it's good to hear you say that, <laughs> you know, in more positive frame of mind and mm -hmm. just happier in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, thanks for sharing that with us. I mean, that, that's, that's some really, really good stuff. And anything, Jan, more? Did... I mean, um, I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe that could be like a, a good, um, um, a good advice for our listeners is that, I mean, you've, you've uh, went to 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 school with your friend Ryan and you started companies with him you worked together with him and i mean it it <coughs> it, it it takes quite quite a friendship to be able to do that and to be able to um go through that because i think for a lot of people like i don't know when it comes to money when it comes to all these things then it, it that kind of gets in the way of 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 friendship but i mean 
Do you have anything, any advice for people that want to start a company with their friend or like that? Like, is <laughs> there, is do there it. like a, <laughs> don't do it. Is there like a particular, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like, is there anything that you could advise people to like, yeah, don't do it. Or like, like, this is what you should look out for. Or like, Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hesitate to give the advice, don't do it, because a lot of people gave me that advice when I started Atomic Fiction. And, you know, I think what they really meant is it's going to be super fucking hard, right? And just brace yourself for that. That's what they really meant. Um, you know, maybe they wish they hadn't done it for themselves, but I think that's for everybody to sort of decide, decide themselves. And it turned out well for us, right? I mean, it turned out... Um, And I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be, I would like, I just wouldn't be doing the projects that I'm doing right now. Had I not done that, I wouldn't have formed the relationships with studio executives had I not done that. So <clears throat> I think one, one good piece of advice would be, um, to not take anybody's advice too seriously. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, I mean, my experience was that, like, I I could listen to what everybody said and I could take that as advisement. And, you know, it's a, it's a good thing when somebody, you know, you're, you're about to walk through the doorway and somebody says, watch your head, right? It's just like, oh, it's a low doorway. Okay, I'll duck. You know, if they hadn't said that, it's a good thing I listened, right? Um, but uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't walk through the door. And, um, and I think that, that it's it's r running running a company or even you know d making a decision to like freelance instead of like you know working with um you know with a bigger company you know you're effectively in, in business for yourself at that point these are things that are there's so there are so many factors that go into whether you're going to enjoy that or not that i think it's like an entirely personal decision to make And oftentimes I found myself not really like there was no one person that I could talk to, no one YouTube video that I could watch, no one article that I could read that would really prepare me for like how like emotionally, intellectually, like I would feel doing any one particular thing. And so it's really just sort of like I I've always had success in trusting my gut because I know that that means that I'm going to be fully committed and passionate about it. And then just asking myself every day, like, am I enjoying this? And if the answer starts to kind of be no, then I start asking myself why. And then we see if we can make, and there's always course corrections that can be made to help to make it enjoyable, to help to make it successful. Um, but I think it really starts with that gut of like, what's, What's more likely to be right for you, whether you're doing it on your own or with a friend or whatever, like, you know, um, and follow your gut and um, but don't be don't be bullheaded about it. Don't be, you know, in the, in the same way that, like, I couldn't be the, the 18 year old that walked into the cutting room at uh, Skywalker Ranch like I knew what I was doing, like I had to, like just listen to everything that everybody was saying and, and kind of almost go in, you know, assuming that I could do great stuff, but like expecting that I was wrong a lot of the time. And I think that like going into business is that, that same, that it takes that same kind of thing, right? It takes that, like, you really don't know. You really don't know what you're getting yourself into. There's no way to know what you're getting yourself into. And for me, having Ryan, you know, um, it was a really good way to sort of like, because we know each other since we were seven, because we were passionate about the same things. Um, we kind of had a, a friendship that was sort of like, sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was less good, but like we, we had a common ground to build from, and then we could check ideas against each other. And when one of us was like, when I was going through my divorce, um, he picked up a lot of weight for me when, he, you know, when he was going through his, I picked up a lot of weight for him. Right. Um, or if one of us was excited about something, the other one found a way to, to sort of like, um, <clears throat> push, uh, push the other one forward and encourage them. Right. So, 
I think just having that other person to sort of like um, to bounce ideas off of and check, you know, check your gut against um, can be a very, very good thing and make make the whole experience a lot less lonely because it is it is lonely. Um, you know, when you have, you know, a company of 100 people and you can't tell them that, hey, if this check doesn't come in from the studio in three days, like I'm not going to be able to pay you like, you know, but keep working really hard because we need that delivery to get the check. So, you know, it's like you just can't talk to people about that stuff. Right. Um, and so being able to talk to each other about that kind of stuff was was, I think, really valuable. No, well, that's that's great. And it's really good to see another side of because, you know, everybody says don't mix friendship and money. But I think, you know, when you put it that way, it, it definitely is a one of the pros of yeah. working with a partner. I mean, I couldn't fathom the stress that you have working with a company, but that's really great advice. Um, yeah. I think, you know, like we're, you know, we're about out of time, but I mean, I, I just think that, you know, you couldn't really end it on a much better note than that. Um, <laughs> so thank, thanks for coming on, man. I mean, that's some really good uh, advice. I mean, I think Thanks. people are going to get a lot out of it. Um, well, you, and, you know, and good luck with uh, with whatever comes. I appreciate knowing you, that. It's going to be uh, cool. But I, I, you know, I, I'm excited to see. I don't know. You, you know, yeah. we all don't know. Right. So, yeah, we, um, we all we all don't know. And, and you know, I, I, I just hope that, um, you know, we like I mean, hopefully we get to work together again. And, and <laughs> I, I think that that um I would love nothing more than, you know, through talking through all this stuff, if any of your listeners are, um, you know, they want to leave comments, you know, I'm ha happy to answer questions or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, is it, it just like, I would love more people that kind of went through <clears throat> uh, a, uh, um, a sort of uh, the process of discovery and are in this business be for the same reasons that we were like more of us. Right. Um, and there, there are a lot out there, but you know, there are also um, a lot of people I feel like that get held back by like, Oh, I don't have the education. I don't have, you know, um, the equipment sometimes, um, you know, there are, there are places and ways to sort of like express that. And a lot of times it doesn't matter. Like some of the, the reels that I see coming out of colleges still aren't as good as what we did in the nineties coming out of high school when we had basically nothing. Right. And that wasn't because, you know, of anything other than like, we were so freaking excited about it and so passionate about it. So if, if anything, I hope that, you know, sharing the story can help sort of like show people it's like, like th there's one key ingredient and that is, passion um and uh a lot of other stuff has to go right too but um yeah that's that's it and it can get you here it can get you to wherever you want to be that's awesome oh, that's, yeah that's great intense. okay um thank you so much for joining us kevin and um thank you so much for listening to all our audience if you enjoyed this interview please like comment and subscribe and uh, i'll see you guys in the next one bye